times gone by. In the late afternoon of May the 28th, 1914, just two years after the sinking of the ill-fated Titanic, Canadian Pacific's luxury liner, Empress of Ireland, prepared to depart Quebec City. For her master, this was a dream come true. 39-year-old Captain Henry George Kendall, a veteran of the high seas, was for the first time in sole command of one of the most marvelous ships afloat. As the Empress slipped her moorings at 4.27 in the afternoon, her passengers had no way of knowing that Captain Kendall would soon be steering them towards tragedy. The Empress of Ireland's transatlantic crossing to Liverpool was scheduled to take just six days, the first two of which were to be spent on the closed waters of the St. Lawrence River, Canada. In reality, the journey would last less than 10 hours, and when it was over, the Empress of Ireland would rest on the bottom of the St. Lawrence, and more than 1,000 of Captain Kendall's passengers and crew would be dead. The mists of time have only served to deepen the mystery surrounding the sinking of the Empress of Ireland. How could one of the safest ships afloat have sunk in just 14 minutes, killing more passengers than the Titanic? How could death on such a grand scale barely rate a footnote in history? And who or what, in the end, was ultimately responsible for such a disaster? After repeatedly reviewing the official record, filmmaker Dave Greener is convinced the truth of what happened out on the St. Lawrence in the early morning hours more than 90 years ago has yet to be revealed. Knowing that vital clues may yet lie trapped within the sunken wreck of the Empress of Ireland, Dave has turned to extreme divers Terry German and Kim Martin, for it may be that only with their help can Dave hope to turn back a page of history and solve once and for all the mystery of who or what was responsible for the Empress of Ireland's nightmare voyage. The Empress of Ireland's journey down the St. Lawrence began without a hint of the horror to come. As Quebec City receded in the distance, passengers settled easily into life on board, oblivious to the danger ahead. Among those making their way to their cabins and berths below decks, were 170 Salvation Army men, women, and children. Well, we were going over to the Salvation Army Congress, which they hold every so many years, and we had looked forward to this for quite some time, and it was quite a, an event for us. Grace Hannigan was just six years old when she rushed to explore one of the world's greatest luxury liners. I did a little bit of looking around that night. My, my father's boss's son took me on a little tour. He was a couple of years older than me, maybe more than that. And uh, we, we went around and looked at the boat. Well, of course, to, to me, it was, yeah, it was just beautiful. It was like a lovely hotel, you know? And uh, everything was just uh, almost out of this world. <laughs> and I was quite thrilled with it. Not so foolish as to claim to be unsinkable like the Titanic, after eight years of safely transporting tens of thousands of passengers on transatlantic crossings, the Empress of Ireland could claim to be one of the safest ships afloat. Still at 2 a.m., with most passengers asleep and much of her crew retiring for the night, the Empress of Ireland would be helpless to protect those in her care. I was awakened by a, a noise that sounded like a, a firecracker just going past the porthole. <clears throat> and I guess the three of us were awakened. And my father thought that it was the pilot coming for the mail. So we didn't bother about it at all, but just a few minutes later, somebody came to our door knocked on the door and told us to get out, that the boat was sinking. And so we just went, just as we were, and 
we could we were quite close to the stairs, but we could hardly climb because they were the boat was listing so fast. As young Grace Hannigan and her parents struggled up the listing stairs, 60,000 gallons of water a second were gushing into the Empress from below her waterline. Those below Grace in the lower third-class berths never stood a chance. Whole families were wiped out by the flooding waters. The Titanic had taken almost three hours to sink. The Empress would go down in just 14 minutes. Anyone who did not escape from below deck within the first five minutes was doomed. As desperate passengers swarmed out onto the boat deck, things went from bad to worse. The increasing list made it impossible to launch the portside lifeboats. With a sudden jerk, the Empress of Ireland pitched over onto her side, tossing Captain Kendall and others into the frigid waters of the St. Lawrence. Rescued by a passing lifeboat, Captain Kendall was forced to watch helplessly as his dying ship lay completely on her side, with as many as several hundred desperate souls clinging to her steel hull. At about nine minutes after 2 a.m., the Empress started to slip below the surface. We sat on the high part of the railing, until the boat went down and then we were thrown into the water and as far as I know the three of us were together for a few minutes <clears throat> then I found myself hanging onto a piece of wreckage news of a disaster on the St. Lawrence hit the world's newsstands later the same morning shock and panic followed according to first reports the Empress of Ireland and the Norwegian collier Storstad had collided in fog near the tiny hamlet of pointe au pere Quebec. Families and friends, desperate for news of loved ones, mobbed Canadian Pacific offices in Montreal and Liverpool. Look at the concern, yeah. the terror on these people's faces. Is, yeah. or, did my loved one make it or not? Yeah. You know, you never stop to consider that it was just more than a thousand people's lives that were affected. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, you know, generations wiped out. Yeah, that, in that day and age, if the breadwinner went down with that ship, that family was destitute. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. It's over. Or for a child like Grace Hannigan. Right? My father's body was found later yeah, on the shore. He was able to swim a little, and he, I don't know whether he made it to shore. But he had a little heart condition, so he probably would be played out before he got there. And I saw him in his coffin, and I knew then that he, he was gone. But my mother, you see, I never saw, so I still thought that she, was, she would come, and I still looked for her, even on the streets. On the bottom of the St. Lawrence, the Empress of Ireland's stately dining rooms, elegant music rooms, grand staircases and charming cafes were now transformed into a macabre mausoleum. 1,012 of her passengers and crew were dead. Of the 138 children on board, only three boys and one girl, Grace Hannigan, had survived. Less than three weeks after the Empress's sinking, a public inquiry was held in Quebec City. In the courtroom, officers from the two ships accused each other of causing the fatal collision. One Canadian newspaper observed that if the evidence was to be believed, the Empress and the Storstad had collided violently while lying motionless two miles apart. One or both of the ship's officers had to be very, very mistaken or lying. But which? Bringing the truth to the surface after more than 90 years will prove to be a much bigger and more dangerous challenge.